Welcome back to Digital Ship Autumn Webinars. We are planning to be here about every Thursday. And today we are bringing interesting topic for you. Uh, and we're discussing what do the new maritime cloud data services have to offer you as a shipping company or software company. Uh, it's a very populous panel today. Uh, we have four great speakers. Uh, Jeff McGew, uh, from, uh, he's a CTO of Stratum 5. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Uh, we have Alan Atkins, who is CEO of... Uh, uh, Maya Connection. Nice. We have Eric Neshia, uh, who is the Vice President and uh, uh, Head of Customer Success of uh, Kernsberg Digital. No. And finally, we have Magnus Lande, who is the Head of Asia Pacific of Veracity, based in Singapore. Oh, good morning. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to remind you before we go into the subject um, that uh, after you will hear 10 minute presentations from each speaker and uh, right after all of them, uh, there will be opportunity for you to ask questions. So stay connected and uh, type your questions here in, uh, in the field. Uh, so now we have Carl Jeffrey, a founding editor of D Digital Ship, moderating the discussion. And I would like to pass over to Carl. Let's get started. Okay, thank you, Vida. So um, what the idea we're exploring here is that there may be more to this cloud data, we'll call it cloud data management, which is a bit of a confusing term, but uh, than, uh, than many of us realize. So I thought we, we all understand cloud data storage and we all understand cloud data software because these have been around for like 20 years now. But what these companies are talking about is some intermediate layer of, of working with data which which sits on the cloud but is separate to the cloud data storage and uh, they're, they're managing data. So it's all sounding a bit complicated, but uh, it's an analogy I, I think fit, fits quite well to, to explain it. So. If, if we start with this point that getting data from a ship equipment is really, really difficult. Normally, you'd have to send somebody out to a ship. They'd have to negotiate with people in the office, negotiate with people on board. They'd be quite fiddly getting into the data and connecting to the sensors. And then uh, you'd probably get some data with unreliable quality, consistency. There'd probably be some security issues you had to deal with. And then you take it back as a file back to the office and you have to figure out what to do with it. That's normally what happens today with getting data from a ship. So I, I thought if we use an analogy of getting water 150 years ago, so you'd have to go down a pump or a well on your street and maybe there'd be other people using the same pump you'd have to talk with. Maybe the, the flow out of the water would be inconsistent or dirty or it would stop or you'd have to go somewhere else. And then maybe on the way home, somebody might try and steal the bucket of water from you. And then when you got home, you'd have to figure out what to do with this bucket. So. So today, of course, we don't have any of this. You just have a water supply to your house. It's got reliable consistency, reliable pressure. It's got a standard fitting. You don't have any complex negotiations with a water company. You just pay a bill and uh, you can do clever things with it. Like if you want to have a jacuzzi or even a dishwasher, you can do this stuff without pipe water. You can, so this is uh, you know, the analogy back to maritime data cloud management. It, we can do amazing things with this stuff, which I don't think people have thought about anywhere near um, as much as they could do. So um, I'd like to start with, start with Alan Atkins, who's CEO of Maya Connection, which is a company founded by MEN, the big engine company, but not um, they're, they're very, very open to other, other companies. So I'd like to Alan, invite Alan to explain what uh, Maya can do. Thank you. Uh, right, good morning, everybody. Uh, and good afternoon for the people on the uh, Far East, and a very good morning to the people in the, in the Americas. Um, so Maya uh, Connection, or Maya Platform, was born out of an initiative, as, uh, as Carl said, uh, from uh, MAN Energy Solutions in, in Germany. And it's based on uh, the idea of having collaboration between uh, different OEMs and collaboration on data between OEMs for the benefit, not only of the OEMs, but specifically also for the asset owners and users uh, and management sites. So if I can share my screen, I can start. Please, Alan, yes. Yep. So hopefully you can see my screen now. 
We do see it, yeah. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So it does exactly what it says on the can, as they say. So Maya enables collaboration and integration across industries. And so when MAN Energy Solutions uh, looked at having this collaboration between OEMs, how we could share data between each other, how we could use uh, data from not just an asset, but the total ecosystem. Uh, we started then looking at focusing on marine as one base, but also looking at energy uh, power systems and oil and gas systems as well. So, but today we're talking about the, the marine industry. So if I can show you a, a schematic of how Maya looks. So what you have on the, on the left-hand side are basically your assets. Now this asset could be an engine, it could be a pump, it could be a ship, which is a total ecosystem. And data is being uh, today collected on the edge and pushed into the cloud, uh, into data vaults, other proprietary platforms. So MAN has a platform called Xeon. So data would be pushed from their engines to the Xeon platform. And likewise, a pump on the same vessel would have data being pushed to their proprietary platform. So as a ship superintendent or an asset owner, they would then receive, uh, would have applications they could actually use from the different uh, data vaults. So then you start to look at how the engine is performing, how the pump is performing, how the exhaust gases are looking like, but you don't have a total view of everything together. So what Maya does basically, it enables, it's a, an asset graph a and a security system there that basically puts um, the data into a common form. Okay, you have a data modeling, so the data is coming from the various data vaults in a common form. So you can, then you can start to integrate those data streams and expose them to a, an application layer where you can provide applications around combined uh, into machine uh, or equipment um, uh, dependencies. So obviously, if a pump is uh, temperature is running hot, that has an effect on the engine. Uh, so instead of having to look in two places, you can find it in one. So uh, Maya doesn't hold any data whatsoever. So it's basically a plumbing system. It's a switchboard, some of my uh, clients have uh, taught it as. Um, so you actually have, the data is uh, requested. It's a, a catalog of the, your assets. So uh, when you're in the application there, you ask for data to come through from the various data vaults. And given the right permissions and contracts, the data is then shared through Maya in a common form uh, to actually be then exposed to that application and the application then does what it does. So as you can see across the bottom, so we collect, we don't collect any data, the data is already in existing um, within the data vaults of the proprietary platforms. So um, Maya allows you to create a, a framework to share data between the existing platforms. So, it has to be done though on a, um, a basis where it's permissions and contracts. So you're not allowed to see all the data if you haven't got that permission. Uh, you kind of can only see the parts of uh, certain assets that you're allowed to see. So it may be a, a ship owner when he logs into Maya, he will see his total fleet. Uh, but you can also then go down lower to a particular asset and down even lower to a particular data point. So Maya is not holding any data. It's basically instructing the various data vaults to release the data to come through in a common data modeling form, data model form uh, through Maya and then to the application layer. Okay, so when you look at there on the platform layer, you can see that we have their operator X, which could be a shipping company, uh, OEM Y, you could have several, OEM, you could have OEM A, B, C, D, E. For the different parts of that vessel and then you also have service providers who want to actually offer a service as well to that uh, particular uh, asset if you like okay so i go to the next slide this is what my idea is this basic offerings so i can more or less read it out for you as well it might was developed to achieve efficient operations across organizations so providing a common reference index to describe the asset and their relationships and the data around them. And then based on authorization to share it in the right places. So MAN had this idea to set this up and they wanted to set it up as a independent and non-profit making organization. 
Today, MAN owns 100% of the holding company, which is Maya Connection GmbH. Um, we are now, as you've seen in the press releases, uh, Rolls-Royce Power Systems are now also coming in and uh, becoming going to be the second founder member for the Maya platform. So we will have about four, five, six uh, founder members, and they will steer and develop the platform in its destiny, destiny as it goes forward. And then we'd have members on board. Uh, these would be paying members. They wouldn't have a choice of how the, the, they can put inputs in, obviously, but they don't have a seat at the table to design how the platform should look or what uh, options that should be built in the future. So this would be then uh, the, the cost of joining Maya would be just to basically cover the initial integration to the platform and then a small fee to cover the um, infrastructure and uh, data usage as it, as it goes on. So a very, very lightweight platform, not expensive to run, uh, but is a key point for getting the message across from uh, getting the, a better look at the ecosystem. So one of the benefits is, so you can see here we have a fully fledged platform today and with uh, options to data do the data modeling etc uh, we can provide a sandbox for your development and this really gives you a fast time to market so these are the things that you would get if you join Maya as a, as a member uh, so obviously the asset owner being the uh, ship owners or the uh, operators would be able to then have a view of the total uh, total ecosystem and a total fleet if you like so here we're showing uh, I've this is a screenshot, not, not a live demo, but uh, we can provide live demos if people want to see this. So this is an application, a POC that we've set up uh, through Maya. And so when you'd logged into Maya, it would recognize you as being who you are. And it would know all authentication has already been done in the proprietary platforms. You're just logging in and, is author and you can tell when you've logged in what your authorization level is. And then uh, you'll see what you can see. So this is the view for a ship owner. So he would then see his asset. You could then see some graphics. Um, as I say, this is just a, a demonstration. See the graphics of certain parts of the equipment on his, on his vessel, uh, which is all time series data. And then on the side, we also have the opportunity to show events. So here we're just showing a looping event, which is uh, alert and then resolved. But down the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's two um, connected applications. So here, if there's a, a message that says an alert on the engine or alert on the pump, you could go to whichever the um, networks or whichever platforms you wanted to look more deeply into, click onto that and you go directly into Manseon or click onto that, you go directly into a new OEM app or whatever. So you could have say 20 different OEMs at that point and you don't have to log in again, you go straight into that uh, point. So that's the benefit for the, the asset owner that he can go from to one point and access all the platforms in one point and then work with um, the various OEMs who will work together. So collaboration between OEMs is so important with this. We need the OEMs to join. And then we set up all these contracts, et cetera, so we can actually share data between the OEMs and obviously for the benefit of the asset owners and also the development of the combined ecosystems as we move forward. So I'll just show you one more slide. And this is another view. If I drill down into the asset overview, I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, you can then see here, you have not only the, the uh, fuel temp temperature, the oil temperature on the, on the engine, but also on the bottom level, you have both uh, information coming from the MAN engine, but also the fuel pumps um, upstream of that uh, engine. So you then can see two things together. Okay. I think I'm out of time, so that was my presentation. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Well done. Yeah, there's, there's one question on the Q and A. Maybe you take that by by chat later while um while Eric is talking about uh, KPIs. But um, I'd, I'd like to welcome now Eric Nesher from uh, Kongsberg Digital, who's um based in in Norway. So we've got a case study on how shipping companies can have more affordable applications, more collaboration, and more remote services to be efficient. So I'd like to welcome Eric. Uh, Eric, cheers, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Carl. So uh, yeah, so just like, like Carl just said, so I'll touch a bit on like the background of uh, Vessel Insight. 
and also how we collaborate with the mainly software vendors out there. And also I will provide you with a few use cases on how uh, our customers utilize the data from uh, Vesla Insight in the end. So uh, first, well, in Kongsberg, we believe that we will see a rapid uh, adoption of digital solutions in the next 12 to 24 months. Both due to the, like, the underlying trends like regulations and technology, because also the COVID-19 crisis. Historically, across all industries, during crisis, the success of technology providers has been booming as companies need to look at alternatives for cost reduction and also in human competence. So this is the shift and the trend that we believe uh, that can benefit lots of software vendors out there in, and especially also in the maritime industry. So the question is a bit how this will play out. Uh, so we believe it will be starting by connecting the vessels because there is already lots of data generated on board vessels today. Uh, if this is captured, aggregated and used in the daily decision making, it can help owners and operators with significant cost saving. So in the illustration to the left on the slide you can see now, this is BCG and they identified OPEX savings of 15% just by using today's solutions and not future solutions out there. So obviously there are many providers out there to support digitalization in, in this industry today. Uh, every year in Kongsberg, we identify the complete software landscape in, in maritime. And we see an increase every year, year for year. But anyway, the, the adoption of digital so solutions are still struggling. Uh, and this is because one is that the cost to invest uh, in digital is significant. And every vessel is unique, as you know, and there are no data standards at all. So many vendors don't have the domain knowledge to provide their customers or our ship owners with reliable data. And also for cybersecurity and cost perspective, it doesn't make sense to have one edge box with dedicated gateways for a solution. So with this, with this challenge, uh, these challenges in mind, uh, in Kongsberg, uh, we launched Vessel Insight last year uh, during Nord shipping. So Vessel Insight is, is our solution to bridge the gap in the market. So with our domain knowledge from 40 years experience collecting data on the vessels, we have launched the first industrialized data infrastructure with an edge box that interfaces with the automation and the control system we get access to a majority of the data on board. And we structure it and make it available for the customer. And, uh, and also for the applications in the marketplace on the top of the slide you can see there. So we had three focuses when we built this. One, we want to make it at the uh, provide it in the market at low cost. Simple installation, bit remote uh, configuration. Second, look at data quality and the data we pass on has to have the needed quality to provide value to all our customers out there. And also for customer software vendors, of course. And third is of course cybersecurity, and it had to be according to cybersecurity demands. So uh, the success of SLE Insight since the launch is already documented across several different segments. We have delivered results in, for example, fuel consumption, condition monitoring, and more. And to meet these results, we have seen two reasons why uh, companies invest in Vesely Insight. And more than 80% know that they need to tap into digitalization, but they don't know how, and look at connecting the vessels and get access to vessel data as the first natural step. And the remaining 20% know exactly what pains they want to solve. And these customers utilize us the, ecos uh, the ecosystem we have with leading, uh, leading applications in the field. And these applications can both be Kongsberg's own developed applications and third-party ac applications. So we even invite our competitors uh, of third-party applications, competitors of Kongsberg existing applications into the marketplace. Uh, and also a bit on like how we want to secure the last 80% with ROI is that we have a dedicated customer success team so they work with a wide range of customer of Kongsberg customers. And our task is to be with them all the part of the way during the onboarding and make sure they meet the defined business objectives. 
And in the beginning of the collaboration, we create what we call like a six month success plan, where we define use cases there based on their hypothesis on like where they believe that they can save the most money and where we can see the quickest wins. And we relate some KPIs together to ensure that we meet those business objectives. Uh, so, and in addition then to, oper uh, to increase operational ac accuracy, another universal thing that we, we have seen among most of our customers is that they're working with reporting. And this is why we have also developed like a Microsoft certified uh, Power BI driver. It allows Power BI to use Vessel Insight as a data source, which enables uh, us to make periodic reports and customer custom dashboards sitting in the customer's office space based on the Vessel data. So this is a bit on how we work. Uh, so we create then the centric dashboards and reports. And then in this example, for example, we, get, we investigate if it's a main engine or if it's a power plant that is con consuming fuel. Another report that we work for with, with customers is a customer that had the challenge and was it due to high cost of accurate flow meter measures. They had to find new ways of measuring fuel consumptions. So then what we did is we went in, we, we, we got the data we needed and we calculated fuel consumption based on all tank volume, meaning existing data on board. And this provides them accurate data over time with, the need, with no need for additional investment. And then for this customer, the last customer to show today is that uh, they want to understand the specific fuel oil consumption and in which load range the engine is performing the best. So with the SFOC and the load data, we understand here where her engine consumes the least. And for this vessel, it's around like 63, 64%. Meaning that, so this is providing uh, our customers with data as well, but also what we help them, like we help the people on shore to better manage the people uh, on the vessels as well. So they can use this to, do, to make operational decisions, improving and improving over time. Yeah, so that was quick from us on uh, how, what we do and uh, how we, why we exist. Well, Thank you, Eirik. Well, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, and that's even, even less than 10 minutes. That's, uh, <laughs> Is, is, there time management, you know? yeah. is, is there opportunities for other companies to work with you or do you just work directly with the shipping companies? Would there be an intermediary company that could nah, work so, so what we want is to invite other companies, of course, into our ecosystem. And so we're building the infrastructure to, to, to help companies and ship owners and operators to get hold of the data. And it's all their data, of course. And then we have the marketplace on top. Where they can actually, where they can feed that data into different uh, software and vendors to help them to make the right decisions as as uh, as ship owners, uh, being like a fleet manager, technical superintendent, or, or whoever sitting uh, sitting on shore. Uh, and into this marketplace, of course, we invite anyone. Uh, and it's uh, we believe it's like for us to be successful and for us to, or for us like everyone in this in, in this market to be successful over time. It is necessary for us to collaborate. Uh, and the challenges are, of course, there are no data standards and these things. So even on an OEM level, we want to collaborate with other, other OEMs. Yeah, well, that's great. I think that's the most fascinating part, the opportunity it makes for companies to do stuff, I think, isn't it? Yeah, so I'd like to welcome next Jeff McHugh, who's joining us from New York State, which is, um, He's, uh, we didn't realize we had uh, people from the US on this uh, call, but he's uh, because it's a company based in Britain, but <laughs> he's got up at half past four in the morning to drive to the office to, uh, to talk to you today. So uh, he's going to talk about how data correlation can be a key factor in vessel performance, the exponential growth of data emanating for every aspect in the data chain, bridge instruments, engine room, sensors, ports and satellites, connecting the dots. It's a technical challenge. It could be a costly one. So I'd like to welcome Jeff. Cheers. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Let me take a moment to share my screen. Okay, so again, thank you, everyone. My name is Jeff McHugh. I'm CTO of Stratum 5. And today I'm going to talk to you about correlation of timelines. 
I'm gonna, just give me a moment, I need to, sorry, I need to uh, make my screen smaller here. Uh, so the presentation is going to be in three parts. First part is why build in the cloud? And the second part is gonna be on the correlation of timelines. And the third part will be a series of examples that show correlation in practice. Why build in the cloud? Well, APIs are the cloud. APIs make sharing information possible. They are ubiquitous. And if your business needs to produce, oh, excuse me, I'm just getting an error on my thing. Uh, your host has asked you to start your video. Just a second, okay, sorry about that. Can everyone hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, technical difficulties here. So, <clears throat> Okay, Who's wonderful. You, Jeff? We see you. Go on with oh. your presentation. All is okay, going well. well. <laughs> I apologize. Technical difficulties. I got an alert uh, that came up from um, from Zoom telling me that uh, the, the video had stopped. So, uh, okay, great. So everyone hears me. So bear with me. I'll just start the slide again. Okay. APIs are the cloud. APIs make sharing uh, information possible. They are ubiquitous. And if your business needs to produce or consume data, you need to embrace APIs. Let's look at how the journey starts. So uh, if you're the typical company, you'll wanna put something in the cloud and the first, uh, the first decision you'll need to make is uh, where to put it. And there's really only three choices, AWS, Google, or Azure. But, <clears throat> and perhaps there was a need for just getting a, a single noon report off a ship. So you go and you develop that. And then that's successful. And then there's a second ship that's added. And then a third ship. And then before you know it, you've got, the whole sh you've got the whole fleet sending you noon reports. Then there's a need for, for weather. So you tap into a, the, the API from NOAA and begin capturing weather every day. Then there's a need for the most recent positions of all the ships in your fleet. So you tap into an AI AIS provider and their API. Then employees need some custom tools built so that they can do their job better. And so that gets built. Then there's back office APIs that start needing to be plugged in, things for ERP and Trueless. Then someone has the idea to actually start sending information back to the ships and then back to the back offices. And then there's port data that you get through a third party API. And then finally we arrive at near time telemetry data coming from, from sensors as your ships and your whole fleet becomes wired. When does the journey end? It never does, and the data keeps growing. So how much data can a single vessel produce? The answer is a lot. A single ship might generate 2.6 million separate data points per year. A fleet of 100 vessels, over 260 million separate data points per year. Incidentally, Stratum 5 processes over 7 billion data points per day across all of our vessels and weather data. But with this deluge of data flowing in, information gets lost in the noise. The key is understanding the context. The timestamp becomes a way to organize and relate these data sets. And we call these the timelines. So correlation of timelines, bringing context to content, examples in practice. So the first example I want to show is uncovering the cause in a, of a drop in speed. So what you see here is a graph of, uh, of two timelines, one labeled instructed speed and the other the daily speed over ground. And that's coming from the noon reports. And as you can see, there's a drop in speed of about 1.5 knots uh, shortly after June 5th. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the cause of this? So you add a third timeline, which is coming from the sensors, and that's just showing the speed over ground. And that too shows a consistent drop off over a 48 uh, hour period. So you add a fourth timeline to the graph and you can see calculated resistance reveals that there was indeed an adverse current. Finally, you add a fifth timeline, which is calculated speed through water, and this reinforces that revelation. 
The next example is how correlation can help surface up errors. In front of you, you have a chart of a track of a, of, of a single ship, and you can three, see three points that are coming in for positions from a, a simple set C device. Adding a second timeline for AIS, you can see that there's many, many more positions, but they're all aligned and everything looks very clean and, and normal, exactly as what you would expect. So you add a third timeline, which is coming from the noon report, and suddenly you see that that report position is, is sort of out of bounds. It's way off where it should be. Somebody doesn't look quite right. Maybe it's an incorrect lat long. Maybe the timestamp was recorded incorrectly. And uh, for whatever reason, it's an anomaly. So the noon's actual position uh, can be fixed by deriving an, inter an interpolated position and everything's back to normal. The third example I want to go through is detecting late arrivals and how correlation can help with that. So in front of you, we have uh, a, 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 sh a ship uh, en route. It's uh, headed to San Francisco. Its ETA is July 6, 2200. Uh, we also have noon reports coming in, uh, instructed speed showing 13 knots, and we have a root file that's come from ECTUS, and of course we have the weather data. So we have four disparate pieces of information all uh, uh, glued together here. And when, you, when we calculate the, the root and we factor in all of the different uh, parameters coming in from the weather data, speed over ground, speed through water, current speed and significant wave height, what's revealed is that the ship on its current route, based on its current instructed speed, will not make its current uh, ETA. And in fact, our calculations show that it will be delayed by six hours or more. So in this case, then an alert could be sent to the ship, uh, any stakeholders, the business, anyone who's interested in knowing that. Uh, the fourth example I want to show is how correlation can, can help with piracy mitigation. Piracy, of course, is a serious concern in the global shipping community. There are high risk areas throughout the world. This concept was developed as a research project within our own team of subject matter experts. And the challenge was, could data correlation and machine learning be used to help mitigate and assess risk of piracy for planned voyages? The influencing factors of piracy are numerous. You have geographic region, you have distance from shore and ports, you have weather conditions, wind, wave, visibility, you have the speed of the ship, the freeboard, you have the vessel type and its condition, whether it's laden or ballast, and you have light conditions, daylight, full moon. Of course, there are other factors. Can anyone think of a, of a factor that isn't included on this that might be interesting? We discovered one, day of the week. That's right, day of the week is a contributing factor to piracy attacks. After processing all these influential factors through machine learning, a clearer picture develops and it is determined that real-time piracy risk assessment could be built. In conclusion, data across every industry is increasing at an exponential pace. Uncovering the underlying context that is buried in this storm of data is vital. And correlation is one of the techniques that can help reduce the noise and bring context to content. Our platform podium is well suited to help you do just that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's a great, great use cases, the whole environmental stuff, the piracy stuff that all are, I mean, it's great. It also gives the digital stuff a kind of context when we know what goal we're, we're aiming towards. So um, I think that's great. I, th I think we'll go, we'll go on to, uh, to Magnus now before the discussion, but I'll, I'll just point out to the speakers, I think there's a lot of uh, open questions about this connecting data from the vessel <laughs> challenge, <laughs> which is sitting as open. I guess that must be the hardest part. So maybe if you want to think about some, some perspectives on, on those, it might be a good, good thing to bring out um, in the discussion. But I, I'd like to welcome Magnus Lander, who's from uh, Veracity by DMVGL. So we're actually going all the way to Singapore now, which we also didn't realize <laughs> when, we, when we planned this. So uh, yeah, it's a bit late, late in the evening. So. Um, Veracity has been around for a long time, um, but it's a uh, very interesting companies that they're getting involved with and uh, 
We can see um, lots, lots of great partnerships, lots of news coming out. So I'd like to welcome Magnus. Cheers. Thank you, Carl. And um, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, Yeah. So, yeah, my name is Magnus. I sit in Singapore, head of APAC for Veracity. And I will give you today a short backdrop more to the angle of why everyone in shipping, and particularly the asset operators, owners, and managers, need a platform ecosystem. So, let's take uh, an analogy. Have you ever tried to lose weight or excel in exercising? The status quo and goal is often very clear at sight with how to get there. At least to my experience, we often start out very excited and we feel good energy and good ambitions. And a few weeks later, we tend to lose some of that excitement. Maybe the gym subscription turns into an investment without a return on investment to, to a gym company. The HR sensor we bought, the sport watch, the Strava subscription all lost its value. Well, we typically only have perhaps an unrealistic idea on what we want to achieve with no real strategy in our roadmap. The goal might be wrong, and we have no idea on how to get there. Most of, our, uh, most of us are also not experts or educated within the sports, the nutrition, the training, or even the tools that we try to support us. We just do what we always have done, get at it. And this has never really worked. And I do think that we start to see a bit the same trend for shipping and digitalization. And as exercising and shedding weight is not new for any of uh, the human race, neither is cutting costs and improving processes for shipping. The only difference is that has been mentioned earlier today, we now have given the opportunity through digitalization to get the enhanced support and insights to help us improve and also sustain the improvements. However, so far in digitalization, it's quite clear that we typically end up falling into the same improvement trap as we do with exercising. We're thinking too small, too short-sighted and unconnected, and we think we can do it all at once and alone. For digital and shipping, there is a need for more strategic approaches instead of running isolated and unconnected, at least not unrealistic projects. I myself have seen a lot of overly promising one use case at a time without any connection and long-term goal in sight that has led to little or no effect. And we also believe that we need to start with there to invite our IT departments into the strategic business room so that we can start on the journey of acquiring a best of breed partner and technology strategy to cope with the limited resources, both in numbers and competence that each and every one of us have in the shipping community when it comes to this topic. So let me explain a bit further and bear with me on this slide. Digital is really about two things. One, it's about to start the journey. You have to start to get somewhere and you have to start building a foundation for the journey. And namely, this is a journey towards a more insight-based operating model and way of working. Simply looking at the figure on the left-hand side, if we reflect on what digital means. Today, shipping is highly operational. It's silo-based. A lot of the decisions are gut field uh, based and there is a vast distance between the so-called boardroom and end room. With better and timely access to data and insights, amongst many things, this will of course help to remove the gut field decisions being made on a ship per ship level, chief engineer per ship engineer and per equipment. And at the same time, it's enabled to uh, connect the company's strategic market and business needs, which change all the time, to, the, to govern the operations in a closer collaboration. And it's a notion of this that the latter, to achieve the latter, uh, this is really about acquiring capabilities. And then if you look at the fi figure on the right hand side, you need to acquire the capabilities to acquire and manage data, which has been talked about, and you need to acquire the capability to deploy the data and the insights where it is needed to whom at the right time. And this you can look at in the picture uh, shown here, where you can see that there's a strong correlation between cost, uh, between um, capabilities and the value and complexity they bring. Um, you have to adapt these to the organizational potential and ambition. There is no silver lining to this for shipping as it is uh, for individuals when it comes to exercising and training as mentioned. There's vast differences on legacy IT uh, burdens or not, old versus new vessels, having in-house or outsourced technical management, etc. And at the same time, decisions to do something and get going 
very vastly from needing CFO approval to simply in, uh, adapting to a North Star principle of, of doing something, which also Kongsberg alluded to. Um, which is important to this picture from, for us is that you really have to manage to have two thoughts in the head at the same time. Because at firstly, you need a data platform to be scalable, to empower you to manage and deploy the data that you are to work with, whether it is non-IoT data, noon reports with social medicine, IoT to picture videos, and to easily manage to connect them to the applications, stakeholders, or other data platforms that you need to work with. So you need to make sure that anything can be integrated to your platform so you can reuse the investments and not have to double up. And secondly, a competence and culture platform where you just like with technology, you need to build the capacity and organization to deploy the insights that will come from the data and to change the way of working and to drive this transformation. This last part is likely the most overlooked one. Here today, we are four players that can help you with a lot on the technology, even on the competence and culture, but you have to do the most of the heavy lifting yourself on the latter. Digital is about change, namely how can you improve if you want change? And neither is done overnight. But you have to begin at one point and make sure that when you do, that whatever you do today points to the future and scales a foundation for, for what you're going to do next. And this storyline, by the way, is a very good representation, at least from our point of view, why so many ML AI pilots with complex data and algorithms have failed to scale. Namely because there is no scalable foundation of technology, competence or culture supporting it. You gotta learn to walk before you run. Let me add some technical issues here now. Sorry about that. My screen went all black. Um, I'll try again. Um, yeah. So then, if you go to a customer, taking this um, uh, recipe. Oh, no, <laughs> let me start again. So we have a customer case here uh, that has followed this recipe and analogy quite successfully. They started out with a strategic decision to begin the digitalization journey. We helped them build up some return on investment estimates to get going, but that's beside the point. The point was that they made the decision to start and followed, they made strategic goals with specific numbers like the three ones here, crisp and clear for the company to prioritize their activities towards. Next step naturally became to work their way backwards from strategy, finding meaningful use cases and partners to work with to solve the use cases, while keeping strong focus on building that scalable foundation of the technology, competence, and culture. And the first thing they, uh, they, they immediately learned was that the management completely stopped uh, trusting gut feel, insights, and decision. They wanted to ask for the report. They wanted to ask for the data, because now all of a sudden it was available. And at the same time, the innovation capacity in the company grew tenfold because of having the data in front of them just changed the, their mind on how they're thinking. When it comes to, to, to real dollars and cents, they managed to achieve um, fuel savings in the range of 50,000 US dollars per vessel, coming from a combination of identifying a suboptimal setting on the power management of the, these new builds we're talking about here, and managing to optimize the operations across the equipment identified. And of course, from a long-term perspective, they managed to start building the foundation to manage their data, to start building the foundation to, to build their ecosystem of partners and OEMs to, to bring them together, and also to kickstart basically the organizational change, um, the form focus on building that competence and culture to, to, to move forward. Um, and then the same thing happened again. So all my screens are black. Just bear with me. Uh, Second, um, sorry about that. I'll try again. We can see your screen, Magnus. So yeah, okay, but my, both my screens are black. Uh, but now, now it's back. Sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So sorry about the disruption. If we then circle back to my initial example, uh, maybe which are is more famous, uh, familiar to many of us. I actively try to improve performance within selected sports. Clearly as a hobbyist, uh, often I fail too. But in principle, I do the same as we need to do in shipping. I select my focus area, for example, the sport, what I, what I want to improve at. I acquire my platform capabilities, 
from Apple, Google, and Microsoft, and the likes. I don't build it myself. That enable me to co collect the data about myself. I choose providers of sensors, equipment, application providers that I make sure I can speak to the platforms of my choice. Everything from a sport watch to a, a butt measuring crank sensor to a, a step per day uh, counter. Um, that can help me give the, the insights I need. This all enables me to create and nurture my best of breed partner and technology strategy to fuel and excel in what sports I'm, I'm searching for. But maybe the last and important one is that once I get this control, I can use that control to work with the people and experts with domain expertise, like coaches or tutors to set, help set the goals and give me the guidelines and, and, and build the roadmaps for me to achieve uh, my targets. And it's on these principles that we have built Veracity by DNA as an independent data platform for the industry, which we have built together with our customers, Microsoft and the NVGL, um, with a partner model similar to many others here today, uh, which is a ready to use platform ecosystem, if it fits for you. However, irrespective of whether or not Veracity is a good fit for you, we do believe that you should very soon make a proactive stance to acquire a data platform, because either you build it with Microsoft or Amazon, which was mentioned, or you buy it. Because if not, you will end up in a technical debt shown by Stratum 5 there earlier. And you need to start to demand from your vendors the open integrations so that you can choose and build your best or breed strategy, like mentioned. And last but not least, you need to set clear goals, go piece by piece, and tune these goals as you learn. And spend at least equal efforts on building the foundation of competence and culture as you do on the technology. Because this is all a big change management uh, uh, transformation. And as such, I urge you all to final words, bring in your IT departments into these strategic discussions and boardrooms. Don't hold them out. I've seen so many cases where one failed to acquire and deploy the right capabilities with the digital. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Well, that's fascinating. I love this uh, big map making view and a <laughs> big picture view and uh, planning it out and you've got to have a data platform and a <laughs> which one you get. Yeah, no, I think I think it's all, all a great message for everyone, isn't it? So I, I'd like to welcome everybody back in again. I, I can't see I, I, Eric or... Uh, um, yeah, so Magnus, can you please stop sharing your screen yeah. and then oh, we will all be back. Oh, I see, right. There we trying go. to figure out where the, the button all of a sudden... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. If, we, if we start off, so yeah, this question about collecting data, I suppose it's no easier for you than for anybody else. I guess it can be really difficult to connect with old systems on ships. But I don't know if anybody has any sort of specific advice about, since we've had a few questions relating to this, collecting data from on board, anything, anybody? I mean, it's very hard to answer, I think, isn't it? But I don't know if anybody has anything they'd like to share. Or if you use man en engines, you can uh, you can connect automatically with Maya. I think that's all taken care of for you, isn't it? I think it was. <laughs> if, the if the engines are connected, yes, yes. So the, it's always a situation where the uh, older engines uh, would you would have to go out there and connect. Uh, the newer ones are all, all already connected, but uh, the old ones you have to go retrofit with uh, edge technology. But that's available. It can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, just as a general question to start things off is, um, I mean, we're looking at a quite different philosophy now in, in, in shipping, because I think there's been all these, we call them, you know, people had a little project and all sort of agile for years, and I'm going to do this little thing and this little thing. And, and now there's a little pushback happening against this. We're saying that you know, you've got to be strategic. You've got to plan this whole out. In the, the last webinar, we had a speaker from Neste who planned out his whole company software application. So it's very different way of thinking about this stuff we're asking people to do now aren't we which i think sort of came out in all of your talks i don't know if anybody has any any thoughts they'd like to share on that i can give some uh, reflections so i at least think that um uh, as for as for my analogy with weight loss there has been a, a bus period where we have um, tried to to use all the newest stuff coming in from silicon valley and found out that shipping is uh, what shipping is and there is a need to figure something out that can scale across different equipments, for example, like Hongsberg mentioned with, with Veselin, that being a, a flexible infrastructure, and the same has become to the technology on the data platform. And as with weight loss, we have learned that it's not just to get going without thinking things through, it will fail. And I think we're in that brink now where we need to think about why and what we're doing, or doing, or else we will just end up in the same uh, story. That's at least, um, 
my belief. And from my side, I think it's so important that we move towards standardization across the industry. Um, it's uh, sometimes trying to compare apples and pears. Um, and by collaborating with data, um, we should start to move towards uh, standardization and make it better for everybody, especially the uh, asset owners. Uh, yeah, I think I have to echo Alan on that one because one of the main challenges in the industry is, of course, the data standards. And uh, like everyone talks about data and big data and all of these old buzzwords, but the challenge is like data is not worth much unless you contextualize it. You need to contextualize the data to be able for our ship owners and also application providers and so on to have, uh, be able to utilize it and understand it. Uh, and for that, collaboration is key. I think uh, we have to see, we have seen some collaboration, but we have, we'll have to see more and more uh, collaboration going forward, just to, to help us, each other to, to on the, those data standards. Yeah, and also just, just one comment to that, of course, is that uh, for those on the line that are sitting thinking and, you know, using just one, for example, performance management software, you know, a data platform or data standard might not be needed. But the principle here is that was shown in the presentations is that it's going to be more data. You're going to need more applications just like you do on your mobile phone. And if you want those applications to easily read that data, you need that standardization at the bottom. And of course, that's that's a big part of what we are, at least from the Medial side, is trying to push with um, implementing various standards and, and, and have already done that. But it's um, it's in the very beginning. Yeah, I'm not aware of any standard efforts going on now. I mean, there's all the old ones like NMEA and the, you know, the automation systems. Is there any standard, I guess, Meyer itself is a standard, I suppose, isn't it? But is there any standard that comes to mind? That there is, have? sorry, there's data standards on uh, coming out from ISO now for ships, but yeah. Well, we support ISO 19848, which yeah, is um, right. like the, the most basic um, level of a digital twin. It's a... Uh, it describes the, the function and the technical hierarchy of a vessel. Um, that is being slowly adopted by the industry. It was, it was built out by the individual class and, and NYK and class MK and, and slowly being implemented. Um, so there are the standards. And of course, uh, I think we all are waiting for, for, for the big players to use their buying powers together with uh, regulatory bodies to, to push standards through. And I think that will happen. Yeah. Fida, do you want to choose a question from this? Um, yeah, well, there is one, two questions about older vessels. Uh, so I wonder if you have any uh, ideas of, about that. So first of all, have you ever uh, installed, uh, wait just a moment. Um, so how data can be collected from older vessels and have you ever done it for any of your clients before? I guess it's a question for everybody. So if you have any experience with older vessels and some advice, uh, what to do? I'd probably let my colleagues back in uh, uh, MAN and Rolls-Royce answer that. But uh, I know uh, the, the question has arisen there that older vessels, you can connect to. Uh, you can use the same uh, technology. There are data points available on the ships and you just go there, install various edge technologies, uh, which is available from various companies. Uh, but, um, but it is literally you have it's not nor, not normally a self fit it's normally a uh, when the ships in port you have to do it but um it's going to get more and more plug and play but um it is difficult because you have, you can't see the whole picture uh, of an old vessel you need to see what it looks like and typically they don't want wires running everywhere in the ship so there's a question mark whether it should be um it's also a wireless system as well on board vessels at some stage and it depends a bit also on, on which type of systems you're talking about. Yeah. You know, uh, the VDR system, the bridge systems with the NMEA standard that was mentioned by you, Carl, is of course maybe a, an easier one. And then you have the control system, which you may or may not have a safe protocol to connect to. If you don't, then you need to upgrade, which can cost money. And the cargo loading system is probably the, the least easiest uh, to extract data from because of a vast variety of, of industry protocol standards. So, um, and this is, of course, what uh, Kongsberg, by amongst others, are more trained in than, than many. Do you want to take another one, Vado? Yeah, there is a question from Ronnie Blake about uh, data. So how common would you say the providers get access to the information? Do your customers share 
uh, I mean, agree to share or are they more inclined to keep uh, data for themselves? I think this, the simple answer if, from, from our side is at least if it's value coming out or sharing, they will share. It's, it's like on your mobile phone, you don't want to give your GPS signal to Google Maps unless you get the bus tables back, right? It's, uh, I think that's it's as simple as that. So we slash the provider have to be good at facilitating to bring that value uh, in front of the customer. Yeah, I'd echo that. So when we see it uh, working with OEM, different OEMs of sharing data between them, it obviously is the asset users or the asset owners uh, data and they have to get permission for the OEMs to share that data or parts of it. But it's in their benefit. Uh, they see a better control of their total ecosystem if the OEMs can work together. Are these issues going away? Because it's been, I mean, it comes on and off for the last 20 years. <laughs> We've been talking about this, haven't they, about data ownership, but it, it, are people not so fussy about this as they used to be, do you think? No, I still, no it's, it's <laughs> I, I think people, uh, so the question is, you know, whose data is it? And uh, I think, you know, if it's your asset, it's your data. Um, but you have agreements, if you do maintenance contracts with the OEMs, obviously, then you're given permission for them to see the data from that. So. Again, as my colleague was saying there, that uh, it's, it's got to be the benefit for the uh, the users at the end of the day, and then they'll share. Yeah. I think you will see more of it. Uh, you know, we have we are in the infancy of the digital transformation, if you like, in shipping, which means that the more data will be used, the more uh, arbitration and similar will probably pop up. Um, you know. That's even, um, of course, uh, companies that will be afraid of having too much data because you can be held liable. Uh, so it's so it's not um, straight arrow. Uh, all of this. Oh, maybe we'll finish with one one last question. I think the one at the top of the list here about um, exactly. data. Do you want to read it out for me about the uh, volumes of data over VSAT links? <laughs> Okay, Carl, I don't see the question that you oh, picked, so can you read oh, it out, please? Well, the, the one you picked, it's disappeared. The, the question about time series data is the most useful, and that gets enormous volumes. I mean, people have been talking about this edge computing where you can come out somehow sift it on the ship without taking it all the way home, but I, I don't think that's something any of you talked about, but that means you've got to have your systems on the ship. Has anybody got any perspectives about the best way to handle time series data, how you filter it out so you only taking one reading per day rather than one reading per second, if that's, if that's all you need. We do a lot of that in our, in our platform podium. I mean, we, we, we're very much driven by time series. It's my presentation kind of focused on, on how, how the timelines and how they correlate with each other. So uh, we have found that um, most, uh, the, the most valuable kind of intervals are generally between eight and 12 minutes. And there's, there's lots of scientific research that's shown that as you get in down to like five and four minute intervals, you, it's not a, not a big return on, on additional value from that, but it's, it's, you know, you're still doubling up every, uh, you know, every time you drop from eight to four down to two. And, and we even have a ship that's doing every 15 seconds. And so, uh, and that's an enormous amount of data. So, um, it's it's an interesting it's an it's it's sort of finding the sweet spot. I mean, certainly you need to be granular enough that you have meaningful information between positions and and uh, and can react uh, in a timely way and and have enough kind of detail to really really detect the, uh, the the anomalies and things that you're looking to to extract from. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, I think we promised to try and finish this off by an hour, so I guess we'll we'll finish there. I don't know if Ida, you'd like to have any closing words, but thanks very much for one well, for me. So oh, well. Uh... There are a few questions individually for each speaker. So maybe what we will do, we will simply uh, ask the speakers to answer these questions uh, for you off the camera. And uh, then we will pass it uh, back to the audience, whoever participated today. Is that okay? So thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, if you are interested in uh, more content uh, and more topics that we are planning uh, this autumn, uh, please go to the website webinars.thedigitalship.com and pick your favorite ones and register now. Um, so thank you very much and hopefully see you in our future webinars. Bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.